Part One, Section One of the Sinking of the Merrimac. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Sinking of the Merrimac by Richmond Pearson Hobson. Part One: The Scheme and the Preparations. Section One, containing a suggestion from San Juan, unsinkables from Havana. Admiral Sampson announces his purpose, the plan of feigning a chase, why discarded, the plan of stealing in adopted, two methods of sinking the collier, the torpedoes, arrangement of the torpedoes, the firing of the torpedoes, other details. On May 29th, 1898, Admiral Sampson's flagship, the New York, lay at Key West, outside the reef, hurriedly coaling from lighters on both sides. The Oregon, just arrived after her notable voyage round Cape Horn, lay near at hand, coaling with equal dispatch. It was evident to all that an urgent purpose and a definite objective were in mind. A few days before, the flagship had suddenly left the squadron patrolling along the mouths of the channels of the Bahamas, and had run full speed to Key West. Dispatches had come on board, given information that the Spanish fleet, under Admiral Severa, had put into Santiago Harbor. But evidently Admiral Sampson's anxiety was not relieved, for he left the squadron under Commodore Watson to guard the approaches to Havana, dispatched the New Orleans to Commodore Schley on the south of Cuba, and went post-haste to the nearest coaling station, taking his flagship alone. The Admiral's purpose was not known to me, but the circumstances of the coaling showed clearly that distant service was in view. I deemed it proper, after leaving for such service, to make known to him certain features of a plan relating to the prospective reduction of Havana, the details of which, if it should be adopted, would require early attention, and it was while I was making this report that the Admiral first proposed to me his scheme of sinking the Miramac at Santiago. The reduction of so strongly garrisoned a city by land forces would involve enormous loss of life, but our armored vessels, under cover of night, could run the formidable fortifications, if only the mines and torpedoes could be disposed of. For many weeks, as assistant naval constructor with the fleet, I had been studying the elements of strength and weakness in our own vessels and the vessels of the enemy, particularly from the standpoint of stability and fire service in battle, and I had made special reports to the Admiral upon each vessel. This investigation showed that our vessels were particularly weak before a torpedo or mine attack. In fact, the New York, the Wilmington, and the Helena were about the only vessels of the Admiral's squadron that could stand a single torpedo blow, and these vessels were among those least adapted for standing the fire of fortifications. The vessels best adapted for running fortifications, the monitors, would sink like a shot under the blow of a torpedo. This fact had been emphasized during the action at San Juan, Puerto Rico, on May 12th. It became evident, after three hours' bombardment, that the fortifications could not be reduced at ranges above 2,000 yards, and could be reduced at short ranges only with heavy loss. It appeared to me that the best method of reducing San Juan was to run by the fortifications into the harbor. The entrance, of course, was mined, and it was reported on good authority that a vessel had been sunk in such a way as to leave only a narrow space for passage, this narrow space itself being heavily mined. Soon after the bombardment I had reported to the Admiral on a method of going in, asking to be allowed to take two steam launches with volunteer crews to start about midnight and slip in close under the shore through the neck from the westward, and then come out by the main channel, dragging it, sweeping the mines and locating sunken vessels, the exit of the launches to be followed by the entrance of the armored vessels. The Admiral had listened to the proposition kindly, and apparently with approval, but had replied that until the enemy's fleet was met he could not risk even a single vessel, and that under the conditions it was evident that the sweeping of the channel could be only partial at best. 
I then set to work on the problem of clearing a channel of torpedoes and mines. The result was the outline design of a craft specially constructed to be unsinkable, having the general form of an iron canal boat, operating by its own motive power, rendered unsinkable by being stowed with airtight cans a foot long, and made indestructible by special arrangements in construction and by the use of wire cables. I had elaborated a plan for the use of five such unsinkable craft to precede the fleet in entering the harbor of Havana. As the construction and preparation of the unsinkables would require six weeks or two months, I thought it best to make report of my plan to the Admiral before the departure from Key West. I did so on May 29. After listening with attention to the plans, the Admiral said that at the time it was not a question of how to make a vessel unsinkable while entering an enemy's harbor protected by mines, torpedoes, and artillery, but how to make a vessel sink in an enemy's harbor and make her sink swiftly and surely, that it was, quote, not a question of an unsinkable, but of a sinkable, unquote, not a question of Havana, but of Santiago and that at a subsequent date he would consider the question of unsinkables. He then confided to me that he was about to start for Santiago, where Admiral Severa's fleet had taken refuge, and that he intended to sink a collier in the channel, stating that he had indeed already ordered the commanding officer off Santiago to sink such a collier, naming the Merrimack, which was then on the south side of Cuba, but scarcely expected to find it done, though the order had been sent by the New Orleans. He then asked how an iron ship could be scuttled and made to sink quickly. After thinking over the question for some time, I replied in effect that there seemed to be two effective methods, one to drive off bottom plates from the inside, and the other to explode a series of torpedoes placed advantageously on the outside. We examined the chart of the harbor together, and I expressed full confidence in the practicability of putting the vessel into the channel, and stated that I should be happy to be allowed to endeavor to carry out the work. The Admiral then instructed me to study the question in detail and report to him. This was on the morning of May 29. I studied the subject during the afternoon and evening, and thought about it during the night. We got under way about midnight, and stood to the southward, the Oregon having already left. We were off Havana early in the morning, were joined by the Oregon and the Mayflower, and stood to the eastward at full speed. My study included the complete plans, the choice of circumstances in the navigation and maneuvering of the vessel, as well as the method of sinking her. All these features were reported upon, and the plans being approved by the Admiral, preliminary preparations were begun on the 30th. Various plans were considered. That of feigning a chase suggested itself from the fact that Spanish colliers were supposed to be on their way to Santiago. One had recently been captured by the St. Paul, and from her it was learned that others were soon expected. By this method the Merrimack would approach by night from the eastward, when about five miles away she would be discovered by blockading vessels, searchlights would be thrown toward her, and fire opened, care being taken to shoot wide, and to throw the lights in front and on the sides in order to show the splash of striking projectiles. The Merrimack, upon discovery, would bear in toward the shore to within about 2,000 yards, apparently to seek the shelter of batteries. She would throw pitch on the fires to make heavy black smoke, as if forcing her speed to the utmost. She would head in toward the entrance and turn full down the course for entering the channel, blowing her whistle in blasts as of fright and distress. The searchlight would flash across and show a Spanish flag at her peak. On approaching, the lights would be thrown on the entrance to facilitate her navigation, but care would be taken not to allow them to rest upon her. The shore batteries, which should fire on the chasing vessels, would be replied to and thus kept diverted. If they opened on the Merrimack, searchlights would be thrown in the gunners' faces. However, an examination of the chart showed the difficulties of navigation to be so great that no sane captain would attempt to take in a collier at night or under circumstances that did not admit of the utmost deliberation. It was known that tugs were used by single-screw vessels of any size on account of the turn in the channel abreast Estrella Point. 
The chances seemed to be against the enemy's being deceived, and navigation, depending upon searchlights, would entail chances of failure. This plan, and various other plans involving the cooperation of the fleet, were discarded in favor of the simpler plan of going in alone, by moonlight, just before the moon should set. Surprise, under any condition, could be only partial at best, since a certain amount of light was absolutely necessary for navigation. The conditions for surprise would be more favorable toward daybreak. Moreover, a flood tide must be chosen, so that in case of breaking the anchor gear, the vessel would be set into the channel and have ample time for sinking before the ebb could tend to throw her out, while the chances of being carried by the tide through the whole length of the narrow channel into the inner harbor were very small. The establishment of the port, or time of high tide, was about eight hours and a quarter, so that the tide would be running strong flood as the moon set. The moon was then approaching full, and calculations showed that on Thursday, June 2nd, it would set at Santiago at about half-past three. We were speeding at nearly thirteen knots. The Oregon had demonstrated her ability to maintain that speed, and we should therefore arrive off Santiago early Wednesday morning and have most of the day and night of Wednesday for preparations. Thursday was therefore set for entering, though the Admiral expressed the opinion that it would be found impossible to complete the preparations in that time. The special advantage of Thursday was that there would be an interval of darkness of about an hour and a quarter between the time of moonset and daybreak, while on Friday this interval would be reduced to about half an hour, and on Saturday day would break before moonset. It will be understood that an interval of darkness, though short, might be found of advantage for completing the work or for making escape. Preparations were therefore begun at once, the greatest amount of detail being required for the process of sinking. Investigation had shown that the two methods of sinking the vessel that first suggested themselves were the only ones practicable. That of driving off bottom plates by forces applied from the inside, and that of using a series of torpedoes on the outside. Both of these methods were reported on to the Admiral, my recommendation being in favor of the torpedoes. The method of driving off bottom plates consisted in selecting six plates in advantageous positions along the length, about twelve or fifteen feet below the water line, cutting off all rivet heads on the inside, leaving the plates simply held in place, then placing a small improvised cannon near the center of each plate with crossbars to distribute the force of the explosion and cause the plate to be blown off, whole in each case, instead of merely causing a hole to be blown through it. This improvised cannon was to be nothing more than a short length of nine-inch piping, containing black powder, rammed tight, and held by a strut carried up to the deck beam above, with wedges under the heel, the powder being fired at will by an ordinary electric primer. It was explained to the Admiral that the cutting off of rivet heads would be difficult under the circumstances and would involve two, if not three, days' delay. In consequence, only the torpedo method was practicable for Thursday or Friday. The latter method, therefore, was the one adopted. This method was to arrange ten torpedoes on the port side, placed outside abreast the bulkheads and the cargo hatches, so as to give the maximum sinking effect to a breach opened up by each, the torpedoes being carried by a fore-and-aft belt line, extending along the outside from end to end about twelve feet below water, each torpedo, in addition, having a hogging or girth line extending around underneath the keel for holding the torpedo in place. The purpose of the fore and aft belt line was to take up the strain due to resistance in the water. The form of torpedo selected, after considering all the forms available under the circumstances, was the simple eight-inch charge in its own can or tank to be fired by its own electric primer. The use of gun cotton, placed inside as well as out, was considered and discarded. Various difficulties were encountered in the preparation of the torpedoes, important among which was the arrangement for ensuring water tightness in connection with the admission of the wire cable through the can or tank for the purpose of firing. The charge selected was what is known as the reduced charge, being about 
78 pounds of brown prismatic powder, this quantity being large compared with the quantities used effectively for torpedoes in previous warfare. The 8-inch charge was made up of two parts in surge sacks or bags. The tank was as long as the tank for the full charge, and this left the requisite amount of space for arranging for water tightness. The charge for the torpedo was arranged to be fired by the electric primer, carried in a small bag of four pounds of quick black powder, this bag being in the center between the two charges, the insulated wire cable passing from the primer through the mouth of the small sack and up along and outside of one of the charges. On top of the upper charge were placed two white pine discs, seven-eighths of an inch in thickness, fitting the can more or less tightly, each disc having a hole in the center for the passage of the wire cable. On top of these discs, and for a depth of about nine inches of the can, was poured hot a gummy substance made up of pitch and tallow, which, while warm, would close all openings and make a substance entirely watertight, and which, in hardening, would still be pliable and spongy and not easily cracked, acting also as additional insulation for the wire cable passing through it. Care was taken to examine whether this pitch composition, poured in hot, would burn the insulation off the wire, but no difficulty of that sort was met with. The question of making the cans water tight had been the subject of a conference with the Admiral, in which at first he had suggested the use of paraffin, but not having paraffin on board, the mixture of tallow and pitch was decided upon, with the addition of gum from rubber gaskets intermingled, if it was found necessary to reduce the brittleness. The top of the tank was left the same as usual, only a hole large enough to admit of the passage of the cable was drilled in the center. At the bottom of the can was a short thickness of mineral wool. The preparations of the torpedoes was begun at once, Gunner Morgan of the New York and the Gunner's Gang being detailed for its execution. The torpedoes, ten in number, were to be secured on the port side at the points determined upon for producing the maximum sinking effect, being held by the belt line, extending entirely around the vessel from forward aft at a depth of about twelve feet below the water, as above mentioned, the torpedoes lying lengthwise along this belt line. The wire cable end or head of the torpedo was pointed aft in order to reduce the chances of leakage, the eddy created by the torpedo reducing the water pressure at the hole. In addition, as was mentioned above, each torpedo had a hogging or girth line extending completely around the ship by which the torpedo was kept close into the side and at the proper depth. Two lashings, in addition, were placed near the ends of each torpedo, securing it more tightly to the belt line. Torpedo number one was abreast the collision bulkhead, number two abreast the forward cargo hatch, number three abreast the large space forward of the boiler room, number four abreast the forward boiler room bulkhead, number five abreast the forward engine room bulkhead, and so on from forward aft the positions being chosen, as has already been stated, so as to give the maximum sinking effect. All were placed on the port side, because in turning with the port helm, it would be the forward side, so to speak, making the inrush of water more rapid than would be the case on the starboard side. At the same time, the fact that all the torpedoes were on the same side would cause a list to port, making the water reach more quickly the level of the cargo ports, and would tend in every way to cause the sinking to be more rapid, while the vessel, being without longitudinal bulkheads, would right itself finally as she went under in deep water. Besides, the crew would abandon the ship from the starboard side. The cables from all the torpedoes were led up to the bridge, and from this position all were to be exploded simultaneously at a given moment. With a view to affording an additional guarantee of sinking, the sea connections were to be prepared for opening, and all apertures forward and aft were to be opened, all doors, hatches, and manholes on the inside, and the cargo ports in the sides. The question of fire in the torpedoes involved a serious difficulty. Signals were made to the Oregon and the Mayflower, accompanying us, for an electric machine, but neither of these vessels had such a machine, nor did we have one on board the New York. It was evident that unless we should find that some vessel of Commodore Schley's flying squadron had such a machine, 
it would be necessary to fire by batteries, which are particularly fragile, and in such case it was decided to increase the number of cells far beyond the ordinary number required to fire the primers. The questions of wiring and of the amount of cable required careful attention. These details of the program were approved by the Admiral. There was one feature, however, which he did not approve. It seemed to me that there was an element of weakness in the firing of the torpedoes. The number of torpedoes had been fixed at ten, which at first might seem excessive. I estimated that if all of them went off, the vessel would sink in a minute and a quarter. The number was made large because of the innate weakness of the firing arrangements and the probability of injury before the time of firing. I requested the Admiral to allow me to take in addition two warheads from the torpedoes on the New York and place them inside the Merrimack, abreast of the two most important bulkheads, leading their connections up inside where they could not be injured by the enemy's fire, thus having at hand at all times a positive means of instantly sinking the ship. When these warheads were asked for, the Admiral pondered a moment and then said, quote, No, I cannot let you have them. Two hundred pounds of gun cotton on the inside would blow everything to the devil. Unquote. Those who know the uniformly temperate language of the Admiral will understand the emphasis of this reply. The parts of the program pertaining to navigation had been studied in connection with the chart of the harbor and the pilotage publications. The difficulties of navigation were of even greater consequence than those associated with the sinking of the vessel. Referring to the map, it will be seen that the entrance is very narrow, and that with the slightest deviation or error, the shoal water on the left near the course of the channel would cause a failure to enter. Once entered, however, the conditions of the long, narrow channel were favorable for obstruction for some distance. It would therefore be necessary to have the vessel pointed fair with a sufficient speed at the entrance to ensure complete control with the helm. The length of the Merrimack was about 333 feet, and the width of the channel in the narrow portions ranged from 350 to 450 feet. It would be necessary, therefore, after swinging the vessel athwart the channel, to catch and hold her in this position. The depth of the channel varied from about 5 fathoms to 10 or 11 fathoms. The vessel would draw about 17 feet and the most advantageous position for swinging was carefully chosen. There being only a short distance in which to overcome the speed of the vessel, special elastic arrangements would be necessary to enable the anchor gear to check and absorb the speed, so as to catch and hold the vessel in the athwart position. To realize this elasticity, and at the same time to enable the anchor and chain to work automatically, the chain would be roused up out of the lockers and ranged along the deck. After running out a certain length, the chain would begin to break elastic rope stops, one end of the stop being made fast to the chain, the other to a long rope hawser of larger size, so that each stop before breaking would bring into play the elasticity of the large hawser, which itself would be finally broken. The maneuver decided upon and approved by the Admiral was to approach at full speed, stopping a short distance from the entrance, so that the speed on arriving at the point for the final maneuver would be about from four and a half to five knots. At this point, position A, the helm would be put hard aport. As soon as the ship began to swing, the starboard bow anchor would be let go with sixty fathoms of chain. When about in position B, the starboard stern anchor would be let drop with forty fathoms of chain, the two permitting the ship to take position C, where she would be lying on a span directly athwart. Any additional motion still remaining would be absorbed by the vessel sticking her nose into the shoal on the right side of the channel. If the stern anchor chain were carried away, the movement would cause the vessel to throw her port quarter into the shoal on the port side, the bank being only one and a quarter fathoms deep. The general plan contemplated a minimum crew of volunteers for its execution, with the simplest form of duty for each member to perform. The anchors were to be slung over the sides and held by simple lashings, ready to be cut with an axe, a man being stationed at each anchor. Only two men were to be kept below, one in the engine room and one in the boiler room, 
One man was to be at the wheel, and one was to assist with the torpedoes, making in all a crew of six men. The signaling was to be by cord pulls. The men were to lie on their faces at their separate stations, with the end of a cord wrapped around the wrist, awaiting the pull from the bridge, where all the cords were to converge. A simple pull would mean to stand by, then three steady, deliberate pulls in succession would be the signal for action. The plan contemplated having a lifeboat in tow at the stern, with a long painter, or line, leading forward. After the performance of duty, the first man was to pull in the long painter, haul the boat up toward the ship's side, jump overboard, get into the boat, turn it around to head out, and hold it just off the ship as it swung. Then each man, after completing his duty, was to jump overboard and get into the boat. The torpedoes were to be fired when all was secure and the ship had reached a position athwart the channel. They were to be fired from the bridge. After firing them, I was to jump overboard and join the boat, which would then be ready to pull away, all of the crew having had time to reach it. The boat was to be fitted with life preservers under the bulwarks and thwarts to prevent sinking if it should be riddled. It was to carry seven rifles and seven belts with one hundred and fifty cartridges in each. The uniform was to consist of woolen underwear and two pairs of socks. Each man was to wear a life preserver and a revolver belt with a revolver and a box of cartridges, the cartridges being immersed in tallow. If I should not appear after the explosion, the boat was to pull away in charge of the senior petty officer present. If the boat were interfered with, it should defend itself while endeavoring to escape. If it were destroyed, we were to swim for a rendezvous on the bank under the Morro, just inside the cove, from which an effort would be made by creeping along the bank and swimming at the steep parts to make our way around and well to the eastward of the entrance before putting to sea to try to reach the squadron. In all cases, the party would endeavor to keep together and act as a unit. The question of volunteers being referred to, the admiral expressed the belief that there would be no difficulty in getting the men wanted. By Tuesday afternoon all the preparations that could be made beforehand were well under way. The three vessels were speeding onward along the north shore of Cuba. It is a fine coast, with mountains rising straight from the sea. No wind was stirring, and the clouds hung motionless on the mountainsides. The sky was preparing a weird sunset, remarkable even for the tropics, and the water reflected the weirdness. The spirit of mystery over land and sea and air and sky extended to the sounds. Even the regular bugle call to quarters and evening prayers appeared different. All nature seemed to be preparing tragedy. The enemy was near. The time for action in our sacred cause was close at hand. I lingered on deck. The moon rose bright and clear, approaching its full. On the ships sped. Cape Maysai light appeared in the distance and drew aft till it lay abeam. We changed our course to the southward, and, standing down the windward passage, passed close to the land and caught whiffs of the tropical vegetation. The moon was near its meridian as the vessels rounded the southeastern end of Cuba. Tomorrow we should see the sun rise on Santiago. End of Part 1, Section 1「The Sinking of the Miramac」by Richmond Pearson Hobson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 1. The Scheme and the Preparations. Section 2. Containing Arrival at Santiago and Reconnoitering. Inspecting the Merrimack. Hundreds of Volunteers. Chaos on the Merrimack. Trouble with Anchors and Chains. Final Preparations under Difficulties. The Merrimack's flag, trial trip and inspection, the first attempt off at last, the recall and postponement. The next day, June 1st, as we went on deck very early, we made out the flying squadron in the distance. 
as the new york stood down toward the brooklyn there off the starboard bow stood the moro frowning down on the narrow entrance back in the distance rose the mountains beyond the city from aloft we could see the military tops of the vizcaya and the cristobal colon behind the cliffs of smith's key and punta gorda neck as the new york passed the bearing in line with the inner channel a shot came out at long range it fell short of course but it spoke challenge and defiance we passed the merrimac lying to the eastward locked with the massachusetts coaling alongside and stopped near the brooklyn commodore schley and his flag lieutenant j h sears came off and were met by admiral sampson and his chief of staff captain chadwick and flag lieutenant staunton and all went below to the admiral's cabin soon the admiral and the commodore came on deck and the admiral called me aft the commodore pointed out the location of batteries as he had discovered them in the bombardment of the previous day the sea batteries to the eastward and westward of the entrance could be made out though dimly but the batteries described by the commodore as lying on the slope of socapa the west bank of the channel could not be located the galleries and gun ports of moro could be seen but estrella point and the heights of charuca and punta gorda necks were obscured i asked for a steam launch to go in closer to reconnoitre but my request was declined after the commodore left the new york stood further to the westward to get on the bearing estrella point north thirty four degrees east the course for entering the admiral the chief of staff the navigator and i then went up on the forward bridge there was a division of opinion as to what was really estrella point it was then decided to let me take the steam launch and go in to reconnoitre and the launch was hoisted out and the fires were lighted the quartermaster having reported the masts and funnel of a small craft behind a neck of land to the westward the new york dropped the launch and stood down to investigate the craft which proved to be one of our auxiliaries when steam was up on the launch we headed in though we were delayed by the feed pump getting out of order we soon were able to make out distinctly the batteries to the eastward of moro and those to the westward of the entrance they were not completed and work seemed to be going on uh, all question about estrella point disappeared and i found two good ranges on the mountains behind to help in running in and mentally photographed the view noting especially the high points that would aid in recognizing the entrance at night we avoided some objects awash that looked as though they might be range buoys but stood for the most part straight up the course for entering this course leads nearer the western shore and one of the crew reported seeing men in the bushes and then a rifle bullet passed overhead the launch was slowed down and directions were given to have a full head of steam with plenty of water in the boiler in order to be independent of the laboring feed pump and the coxswain was ordered to stand by to go about one of the crew now reported a signal flying from the new york which had come back it was the general recall i had desired to find out something about the batteries on the slopes of socapa and to get some sure mark on the western side as a guide in entering at night it soon became evident however that the batteries on the slopes could not be seen without actually entering while the bushes came down to the water's edge on the west and no mark for guidance could be found only the moro side would be distinct and the course to pass would have to be regulated by estimating the distance from the moro fortunately on this side the water was deep and would permit of passage close aboard the launch turned and stood out slowly and when well away went full speed for the new york it was now nearly noon the merrimac had drifted farther to the eastward signal had been sent to all the vessels calling for an electric machine for firing torpedoes and the torpedoes were well in hand but half the day was gone and no preparations had been made on the merrimac the new york stood back at speed and shortly after noon stopped nearby boatswain mullen and i went off in a pulling boat and crossed over the massachusetts to the merrimac where coaling was going on at all the hatches
the officers of the merrimac were at luncheon the captain and the other officers forming a single mess everybody was completely surprised when i announced the purpose of the admiral to have the merrimac sunk in the channel that night and i was pelted with questions colin was to continue the merrimac's crew were already more or less fatigued and as they would have their hands full in getting their effects away could give but little if any assistance i made a rapid inspection the bow anchor weighed fourteen thousand pounds the hold contained about twenty three hundred tons of coal which lay heaped up against some of the bulkheads where the torpedoes would be placed a signal was sent to the new york to send over one watch or half her deck force and forty coal heavers the deck force to be employed in preparing the anchors chains belt and hogging lines the coal heavers to shovel the coal away from the sides at the points of location of the torpedoes to prevent interference with their action in blowing in the sides as well as the clogging of the ruptures while waiting for the men from the new york the boatswain and i went below and located the bulkheads taking tape measure distances to fix their positions accurately on the outside assistant engineer r k crank went with me through the boilers and engine rooms and agreed to the use of part of his own force to do the work of preparing the sea connections for flooding and of opening up the cargo ports and all openings throughout when all the work was done we were to go through for final inspection the preparation of anchors and chains belt and hogging lines was explained in full to the boatswain the starboard chain was to be roused up and ranged along the forecastle the starboard anchor to be got over the bow, the port anchor to be unshackled and transported aft to the starboard quarter, the port chain being similarly transported, the bow anchor to have sixty fathoms clear, and the stern anchor about forty fathoms, the last fifteen fathoms to have uh, the stops for breaking. We went into the forehold to look for gear and found plenty in the Merrimack's supply. We selected 8-inch new manila for the long lengths of elastic hawser and 5-inch new manila for the stops. A large coil of new 4.5-inch manila would answer admirably for the belt line and 18-thread stuff for the hogging lines. As we expected the stripping of the ship to begin soon, we set this gear aside to prevent its falling into the hands of some bosun's mate or other provident pillager. When I returned to New York to see about the personnel of the crew and the status of the torpedoes, the starboard watch from the New York had come over under Naval Cadet Boone, and forty coal heavers were on their way from the Brooklyn. Captain J. M. Miller of the Miramac had given directions to his officers and crew to prepare to leave the ship, and was himself leaving to see the Admiral. In reply to the signal for an electric machine, a negative answer had come from all ships. There was not one in the squadron. It seemed a coincidence that the vessels that were known to have them were all north of Cuba. Batteries of cells would have to be depended on. The New York had only a few spare firing cells. The fleet was called upon. I requested Lieutenant Roller to take the matter in hand, get together the cells, allowing three or four times the number usually required for the eight-inch primers, arrange the cells for maximum efficiency, test all the cable for insulation, and actually fire trial primers under the conditions of use. While I was on the Merrimack, Assistant Engineer Crank had expressed a wish to go in with the ship, and had recommended a machinist, Phillips, and a water tender, Kelly, who had shown themselves competent and reliable, and who wished to go. Captain Miller, who expected to go in, had spoken in high terms of his quartermaster and coxswain, young Degnan. There was advantage in having men for the wheel, the engines, and the boilers from the Merrimack's crew, on account of their familiarity with the vessel. So I called the three men up, looked at them well, explained the nature of the mission, and asked if they wished to go. All replied affirmatively, so I decided to take them. The call for volunteers had been made by signal, and names were pouring in by the hundred. It may be said broadly that the bulk of the fleet was anxious to go. The admiral had thought that uh, perhaps it might be well to have a junior officer, and had asked for volunteers from the junior officers of the New York. 
The junior officer's mess responded en masse. Powell, one of my pupils at the Naval Academy, was on deck when I came on board and begged me to take him. Eggert, another of my pupils, saw me and pleaded to go. Men of the New York's crew pressed upon me and used all kinds of arguments to persuade me to take them. It was as though a great favor were being asked, and every means were taken to have it granted. Captain Miller had now returned to the Merrimack. When I was about to leave, the admiral sent for me and said that Captain Miller claimed it as his right as commanding officer of the vessel to go in with the Merrimack, and that he did not see how his claim could be disregarded. My answer was, in effect, that I should be happy to serve in any capacity, but that it must be evident to all that Captain Miller could not be anything but a passenger, even if nominally in command, being entirely unfamiliar with the details of the plans, which it was, of course, too late in the day to become properly acquainted with them, that I had carefully reduced the crew to a minimum and had made the duties the very simplest, and felt it would be unjustifiable, even wrong, to allow a single man in excess of the requirements, and for this reason had refused the junior officers and all others, that besides other considerations we should all certainly be overboard, that my men should be young, athletic, and used to exposure, that probably no one of the age of a commander would be equal to the physical strain, that if there should be a chance to escape we should certainly not abandon the captain, and his presence would probably entail the loss of all, that when the situation was clear to the captain he surely would not insist on going, however great his desire, as he could not really consider that it was right or was his duty to go. The admiral concluded that he would not allow the captain to go. It was understood with the executive officer of the New York, who was in charge of the list of volunteers, that word would be sent as to the men to be selected. I then left the New York with the understanding that notice would be sent when all was ready on the Merrimack, whereupon the admiral would go on board to inspect. Matters on the New York detained me, and the afternoon had worn well along when I reached the Merrimack. The conditions on board can hardly be conceived. Orders had been given to strip the ship, and only a few hours remained in which to do it. Squads from various vessels were everywhere removing articles. The crew of the Merrimack were looking to their own effects. The gangways were piled with boxes, cans, and debris of all kinds, and a barrel of beer had got adrift. To my horror, the port bower chain had not been unshackled, the boatswain and his gang were at work on it, and still it resisted. The starboard anchor and chain were as yet untouched. The coal heavers, misunderstanding the instructions given, had been shoveling coal from port to starboard. Men in the stripping squads were everywhere in the way. It was impossible to tell who belonged to the working squads and who did not. But a confusion existed, and under the circumstances would admit of but slight remedy. Even the gear laid aside for belt and hogging line stops and hawsers had been pillaged. It was evidently to be a desperate fight against time. The idea of getting the 14,000-pound anchor aft had to be abandoned, but there was a heavy stream anchor already aft and another forward. We slung the one forward from the cargo boom to the deck of the Massachusetts, which dropped aft. Then we took it up with a cargo boom aft and proceeded to lash the two stream anchors together, crown to ring, or tandem fashion, which would give the two combined as great holding power as the heavier bower anchor. When we started rousing up the starboard chain, the anchor windlass worked badly. Soon the port anchor chain was unshackled, and it was apparent that the heaviest work would come in getting the chain aft, for the fifteen-fathom lengths could not be unshackled, as the shackle pins could not be driven out, so the heavy chain, the very largest size manufactured, would have to be transported aft in one piece, the whole length of the ship. To save time, we started rousing this chain up without stopping the rousing up of the starboard chain. The windlass utterly rebelled. About thirty fathoms of the latter chain were already up, and it started back by the run into the locker. It was fairly heart-rending to see the chain go charging back, undoing the results of such hard work. 
More than half had run back before it could be checked. The port chain would have to wait until the starboard chain was completely up. The sun was setting before the heavier work could be begun, when finally the chain started up and after getting aft as far as the deck house would not budge further. I appealed to all the men from all the gangs. They took hold, some with their hands, some with the chain hooks, some with rope's ends. The chain started up, but soon stopped again. No effort could make it move a second time. Darkness was setting in. The search for lanterns showed that the strippers had preceded us in the lamp room. Only two or three lanterns could be found, and those were in bad condition. The men were nearly exhausted, having been worked without relief and without supper. We turned steam on, the after winches, determined to make them haul the chain aft, but no tackles could be found. All had been taken off. We used part of the coil for the belt line, and after breaking it several times, finally started the chain, and this measure gave promise of getting the required amount aft in course of time. Hogging lines had been started by means of a weight put over the bow in a span of uh, the line, carrying it below the keel, a man on each side walking aft outside till the desired point was reached. As bad fortune would have it, the lines already put over became entangled, and nearly all had to be hauled in and the work done over. Moreover, the strippers having pillaged the gear laid aside, as mentioned before, the stuff for hogging lines was found to be missing. In fact, the hawsers were just being started over the side, and the coil for the belt line was on deck when we caught and saved them. So material for the hogging lines had to be improvised by unreaving tackles from the cargo booms and by searching among the debris. The Massachusetts, after transporting the stream anchor aft, had shoved off, and with her departure the stripping abated. Now only a squad from the Texas and the force from the Brooklyn remained beside the men from the New York. The New York hailed and said she would send off the port watch to relieve the starboard watch. We had been drifting steadily to the eastward. The Texas and the Brooklyn were not in sight. The coal heavers could do no more work in the darkness below, so the two squads were sent to the New York with the New York starboard watch when the port watch came off. The steam launch had brought off the gunner with the torpedoes, batteries, and wire, and some dynamo men were sent for to help in running the wires. It was dark, for the moon was obscured, and we had little lantern light. But the men just arrived were fresh, and the interfering groups were gone, so we could work with more organization. Cadet Boone took a squad and started the belt line, and when the belt line was around at the height of the rail, where the torpedoes were to be attached, he continued with the same men to get the hogging lines in place. Assistant Engineer Crank had been at work with his men below, and now reported the cargo ports opened and the sea connections prepared all ready for inspection. I went below with him and found things in excellent shape. The nuts were off the bonnet of the main injector, a strut held the bonnet in place, and it required only a blow to knock the strut out and release the bonnet, which was under a head of about fifteen feet of water pressure. The smaller connections and also the condenser discharge which went overboard below the water line would be readily cut in two by the blow of an axe. All openings, hatches, manhole covers, etc., were opened. At Mr. Crank's suggestion, we had already admitted about 700 tons of water to the double bottom. Lieutenant Gilmer of the Merrimack, who had been lending a hand during the day, took charge of the stern anchors. As soon as these should be lashed together and slung over the side and the chain bent on and ranged clear, the boatswain was to take most of the men to get the bower anchor over and put on the stops and hawsers. The gunner and his own men and the dynamo men were leading the wires to the positions on the rail, ready to connect with the short lengths coming out of the torpedoes. Last of all, the torpedoes were to be attached and secured to belt line and hogging lines at the height of the rail, where it was intended they should remain for inspection by the admiral. I had hoped to report the vessel ready by midnight, June 1 and 2, but this hope had been abandoned. 
Toward ten or eleven o'clock the different tasks were advancing concurrently, and there seemed to be a fighting chance of being ready before moon set when the gunner reported an insufficient quantity of wire. A mistake had been made and in the quantity supposed to be at hand. The New York had remained near us, and I hailed for her steam launch and went on board, but no wire was to be found. The vessels of the squadron were out of sight, but a Norwegian steamer, fitted out for cable service, lay in the distance, and I ran down to her in the launch. She did not have what we wanted, but had any quantity of an insulated wire that would answer. We took a coil and came back to the New York for items of which a memorandum had been left, such as life preservers, boat equipment, signal cord, new axes for cutting the anchor lashings, sizing stuff for securing the torpedoes, an ensign, etc. With regard to the ensign, I had asked Captain Miller about the flag of the Merrimack. He said that he had already considered the matter, but had found that the strippers had taken off the ensign and the contents of the signal chest and even the signal halyards. In fact, the men had been so keen for relics and souvenirs that nothing seemed to have escaped. He said that he had, however, an enormous flag, blue field or background with Maine across it in large letters, which he proposed to have bent on. But I was particularly anxious for a large national flag, and put it down on the list of items for the executive officer to get us on the New York. I was a little afraid they would not let us have the flag, so I asked the executive officer not to say anything about it to Captain Chadwick until we were gone, and told him that I should not hoist it while running in, or while doing so could in any way affect the success of the effort, but that I did wish very much to hoist it after firing the torpedoes as the vessel sank. The executive officer was not convinced, and his instinct of the risk involved was true. For though the captain let me have the flag without asking any questions, and it was bent on the halyards at the bridge ready for hoisting, it was never hoisted, for after the work was done and the Merrimack was sinking, and a strong impulse set in to have the flag flying, it was clear, lying at the muzzles of the enemy's guns, that any movement to hoist it would betray our position and cost the lives of us all. My responsibility for the group forbade me to make the attempt. Before leaving the New York, the captain said that we had drifted twelve or fifteen miles to the eastward. It was then nearly at twelve o'clock, and it was necessary to start to the westward without delay. The admiral had ordered the Mayflower and one of the other vessels to place themselves on a range with the course into the harbor to serve for a starting point. The admiral was to come off to inspect with the boats that came to take off the men to the New York. Montague, the only member of the volunteer crew not already on board, came off with me. While on the Merrimack, Mullen, the boatswain, had asked to go. As the letting go of the bow anchor would be especially perilous with the running out of the chain and the breaking of the stops and hawsers, and no one would appreciate the danger better than the boatswain, he was accepted. About the same time Charette came to me and said that he had put down his name with the volunteers before leaving the New York, and he hoped I would take him, for he had served with me when I was a midshipman on the Chicago. I remembered his service well, and good service it was. He had been in the dynamo room, and was afterward gunner's mate, and was the very man to help with the torpedoes and be at hand for anything that might arise. Well, this left only one more man to choose, the man to cut the lashing of the stern anchor. There would be advantage in having a man who could best handle the men in case Mullen and I did not appear. After consultation with the executive officer of the New York, Montague, the chief master-at-arms of that vessel, was selected, and the crew was complete. It was about midnight when the launch reached the Merrimack. After discharging, it was sent back to the New York, and preparations were made for getting under way. It had been arranged that we should have a trial spin before going in. Mr. Crank would remain in charge of the engines till the last moment, having a good head of steam and everything in shape. The run to the westward would answer for the trial, and directions were given for a full-speed run at the highest safe and sure speed. 
we were under way by half-past twelve, and stood to the westward, making fifty-two revolutions, approaching nine knots. The New York stood on also, but was soon left behind. She had the steam launch in tow, and apparently could not tow it faster without losing it. The last few hours had seen large progress all along the line. The stern anchor was over the side, and the chain was being bent on and ranged clear. It was so situated that in coming under strain it would tear the bulwarks out, tear up the hatch combing, and bring up against the mainmast. With the length of chain extending to the chain lockers at the bow, large elasticity would be obtained. The bower anchor was over the bow, slung and lashed, breaking stops were being put on, eight stops between forty and sixty fathoms, and the hawser was in place. It was not practicable to take the hawser over the deck house, as it was only about seventy-five feet long, so another of the same length was added, both to be broken at sixty fathoms, before the rigidity of the anchor fastenings should bring up. One of the hawsers carried the stops, which were far enough apart to allow the hawser to spring back and recover its elasticity after each strain. The belt line was around and at the height of the rail. The hogging lines were in place. The gunner, having reported that at the final test on the New York the battery could fire only six primers, the six most important positions were selected, and the torpedoes were secured in place while the wiring went on. A mist had come over the moon. The coastline was obscure. A heavy black cloud appeared in the southeast, and the horizon was thickening to the south and southwest, and began to threaten the last hours of the moon. Soon the New York was out of sight. Apparently she was making only five or six knots. Captain Miller was sitting on the bridge. Degnan was at the wheel. The ship replied well to the helm, and the gallant captain told about her steering and maneuvering qualities and other virtues, still expecting to go in with his ship. He had let me take complete charge, and I had uh, not thought it necessary to tell him of the admiral's final decision. The light became so dim that the headlands could scarcely be made out with the night glasses. About two o'clock a craft was sighted ahead, then another, on a th southwesterly line in bearing with the first. We concluded that they must be the range vessels, so the helm was put up and we stood out to turn upon their line of bearing from seaward, keeping on the range in readiness for the start after the New York should arrive. One of the craft began to show up an intermittent light. Was it a private signal? I had not been notified of any signal to be expected from a range vessel and gave no reply but kept pointed in toward the craft. It seemed as though the New York had lost us. It must have been nearly three o'clock before her boats came alongside and Admiral Sampson came on board. It had been decided, with a short time remaining, not to wait for his inspection of the torpedoes, and the hogging lines had been hauled down, and the last ones aft were being hauled down when he came on board and inspected. He said he thought we were well out, probably five or six miles, so I asked that the torpedo boat should go and find out what the unknown craft were. When it returned, it reported that they were vessels belonging to the press. The one that had showed the light was uh, perhaps simply a little timid with an idea of being run down. The admiral carefully inspected the anchor and chain aft and on the forecastle. Everything was in readiness for letting go blocks under the lashings with axes at hand. The wiring was complete and responded to the test, the firing ends being on the starboard side of the bridge, ready to make contact. Montague and Charette had led off the signal cords, and with the boatswain had got the lifeboat out and put in the arms and equipment. The boatswain considered that the boat in question would tow better alongside than astern, a long line being got out from forward, another from abreast the boat. When the after hogging lines had been hauled home, the New York's men were ordered into the boats. Before leaving, Cadet Boone asked earnestly to be allowed to remain, but he had to be refused like the others. The Admiral went on the bridge to wait till the men were off, and was the last to leave. On coming on board, the Admiral had gone up to the bridge, and as he spoke to Captain Miller, 
I heard an exclamation of disappointment from the latter. Though bitterly chagrined, the generous captain came up to say a kind word and wish us success. Assistant Engineer Crank, who was still in the engine room, was to remain on board till the last stretch, when he was to be taken off by the torpedo boat that would accompany us to that point. The moon had now gone behind a bank rising up for the horizon. It must have been beyond its setting time before the admiral left. When I had referred to the lack of light and the obscurity of the coastline, the admiral gave reassurance as to the conditions when we should be closer, based on the principle that the intensity of light varies inversely as the square of the distance. But the absolute necessity of adequate light had been growing on me. The admiral said good-bye with a simple word of kindness. With us who knew him, such a word from Admiral Sampson would outweigh a volume. When the launch shoved off with the admiral, its propeller fouled one of our lines, and it was probably half an hour in clearing. It must indeed have been after four o'clock when we finally started. Dawn had not tinged the east, but it was certainly near at hand. We started up slowly, then at full speed. The lifeboat charged out from the side, ready to capsize. We slowed down and shortened the breast line. As we started ahead, again, it charged back and forth as before. It was evident that the boat could not be towed at full speed. Time was pressing, and it had been questionable from the first if there would be a chance to use the boat. We must approach at full speed for success, so I decided not to slow down again. The boat plunged back and forth, and then with a wide sheer capsized and broke adrift, floating away bottom up. We were now clear. The men, stripped to underclothes, put on revolvers and belts and life preservers, took their stations, and tied the signal cords to their wrists. Soon the vessels of the squadron showed up, rather to the eastward. Then we caught the outline of the Moro itself. There was only a short distance to stand to the westward to make the course for entering, north 34 degrees east. A rose tinge appeared in the east. Day was breaking. We should find ample light to enter by. Suddenly a hail came from close aboard on the port side. The torpedo boat, the porter, came tearing up, and Lieutenant Fremont, her commander, announced that the Admiral directed the Merrimack to return. It would not do to disobey, but would not the Admiral reconsider? I know that light was necessary in any case and felt that we could make the entrance. My reply was a request to the lieutenant to return to the flagship and ask the admiral to let us go on, as I felt that we could get in. The Merrimack did not slacken. It was arranged that in case the admiral should consent, the torpedo boat should have four red lights turned on the New York's signal hoist. I told Charette to keep a lookout for the red lights, and we stood on. The torpedo boat reached the flagship and started back at full speed, but no red lights appeared. The admiral was inexorable. We should have to wait another day. End of Part 1, Section 2「2, Section 1 of the Sinking of the Merrimack by Richmond Pearson Hobson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 2. The Runyon. Section 1. Containing Disappointment at the Recall. A Day of Waiting. The Plan of Going in at Sunset. Two Elements of Weakness. Mullins Pluck. Kindness of Officers. Goodbye to the Flagship. The look of things, rehearsing the work, Clausen not a stowaway, precautions for rescue, the last meal on the Merrimack, and final preparations. When the torpedo boat porter overtook the Merrimack and delivered the Admiral's imperative order to return, one could see a cloud of gloom and disappointment pass over the men. No one spoke a word. Every man lingered near his post for some time, not wishing to make the effort necessary to get into a position of comfort. I knew how the men felt. A fearful reaction had set in. I remember catching hold of a stanchion on the bridge and leaning my head back against it as the ship swung round. 
Mullen soon came aft, looking like a spectre, haggard beyond description. Charette was sent down to tell the engine force that the run was off. Mr. Crank appeared at the hatch, stripped to a breech-cloth. He was expecting to go in with the ship, and the reaction had seized him also. The situation must have appealed to the men on the torpedo boat, for before she left us, Lieutenant Fremont hailed with some kind words of sympathy. I told Mullen to have all the men lie down, and suggested that he do the same. He objected for his own part, and insisted that he be allowed to relieve me, and that I lie down myself. It was necessary to give him a positive order. The reaction took a different form with the boy Degnan. Nature's fatigue set in. Seeing a tired look come over him, I took the wheel and ordered him to sit down, and soon he fell asleep as he sat. I made him lie down on the bridge, and he went off into a deep, motionless sleep, utterly unaffected by the hailing and the other noises that set in later. We stood over to the New York, steered up parallel within hail, and stopped. The executive officer hailed and said a relief crew would soon be over, but asked if we could take care of the vessel till the relief crew could get breakfast. We replied that we would take care of her as long as might be desired. The headway, having carried us forward some distance, we put the helm starboard to steer across and circle back, when suddenly the New York started up. Her propeller race began to seethe, and she shot by us at full speed. We looked ahead, and on the horizon to the southwest discovered a craft standing toward the harbor. Soon the smoke began to pour out of the New York's funnels. The craft stopped, turned about, and took to her heels, and a chase was on. The quarry was fleet, and had ten or twelve miles start. She drew hull down, and then disappeared. The New York stood straight on, and gradually disappeared, and for a long time the two columns of smoke told of hot pursuit. The porter stood out at full speed to join in, and we saw her cut over the horizon. There would be hours of chase, and hours for return. A scorching sun rose high in a cloudless sky. Not a breath of air stirred. A blinding glare came out on a glassy sea, and a day of waiting lay before us. Mullen soon came up again to say that the men could not sleep, and to insist on relieving me. I saw that the poor fellow was long past the stage for sleep, but it again required a positive order to make him go down. My instructions were that all the men should lie still in the shade, close their eyes, and think of nothing, whether they could sleep or not. Before long, Charette, indefatigable and always thoughtful, came up with a piece of canvas, a boat cover, and rigged it as an awning over part of the bridge. It was actually exhilarating to watch him do this in his bright, cheery way. When the awning was snug, he went below, soon reappearing with a bucket of water, apologizing because he had not been able to find a glass, and denouncing the strippers for the thorough work they had done in the pantry. This was not the first time he had had a fling at them, for coffee had been in fearful demand all night, and he had searched high and low again and again without finding a grain. The only articles that escaped were some cold meat and bread left by the officers from luncheon. We had finished these for supper, and Charette took it very much to heart that he could find nothing for us during the night. Mr. Crank reported that on one of the boilers a gauge glass had given trouble, so he, Phillips, and Kelly stayed below working on the repairs in the hot fire room. We remained thus till late in the afternoon. The fleet lay off several miles to the eastward and northward. About ten or eleven o'clock the Marblehead and the Harvard stood over, and a boat came off from the Marblehead to get the effects of Captain Miller to put them on the Harvard. Evidently he was to go north. His effects had been put on the Massachusetts before she left us the day before. The boat officer, Ensign Gerhardy, must have seen some evidence of destitution, for he inquired if we had had breakfast, and insisted on going over to the Marblehead to get us something. We told him that what we wanted was coffee, black and scalding. He brought off a steaming bucketful with plenty of hardtack, a superb combination. 
It is inconceivable how revivifying it was. We had been calling aloud for hot coffee, even those of us who were not accustomed to its use. The hours passed without further incident. A press boat passed by and asked to come aboard. The Marblehead asked for the camels or floats that the Merrimack had on board for use in coaling alongside at sea. We told her she could have them if she would send her own men to get them out. Before young Gerhardy left, he suggested that a junior officer might be of service and asked to be allowed to go in with us, necessitating again the duty of refusal. Along toward one or two o'clock, the porter stood back. Evidently the chase had been brought to a finish, or the New York had demonstrated her ability to attend to the case unaided. We signaled the torpedo boat by wigwag to come within hail. The absolute necessity for good conditions of light and the lesser consequences of any difference in the chance of escape had become fully impressed upon me, and taken account of the conditions of the men, it appeared that it would be best to go in about sunset. When the porter arrived within hail, I asked her to go out to the New York, inform the admiral of this conclusion, and request permission to execute it. She said the New York would be along in an hour or two, and little if any time could be saved by her going back. So she stood on down toward the fleet, after being requested to apply to the vessels for additional electric firing batteries, so we could put over the four torpedoes left off the belt. The Marblehead had already been applied to, but had no cells to spare. We had been drifting further out, and the Brooklyn signaled to come closer. We were only waiting for the Marblehead's men to get the floats clear, and these were given trouble. New York appeared above the horizon and stood down toward the fleet. Finally, we were clear. The Marblehead, upon application, had sent over a machinist and a fireman, Phillips and Kelly still being engaged in the repair work. We stood down through the fleet and rounded to, ranging parallel to the New York. When within hail, I requested permission from the Admiral to go in at sunset. The answer from Flag Lieutenant Staunton was, quote, The Admiral's reply to your request is a direction for you to come on board, unquote. The New York sent off a boat and I went on board, leaving Mullen in charge. The Admiral and his Chief of Staff, Captain Chadwick, listened to the plan for going in at sunset and seemed to regard it, as well as the idea of going in after daybreak, as involving too much risk and exposure, cutting off all chance of escape. The Admiral having refused my request, I suggested a modification that might reduce the enemy's fire by having the cooperation of the fleet. The plan was that the fleet, including the Merrimack, should form in column and circle by, passing down as far as the bearing forming the course for entering, each time crossing this bearing a little nearer the entrance, fire not to be opened until first begun by the enemy. On the second or third turn, upon arriving on the course, the Merrimack should break from the circle and dash forward for the entrance. The whole fleet should open on the batteries, which would doubtless answer upon the fleet and thus before the enemy could recover from the first shock and from the idea that the maneuver meant bombardment, the Miramac could enter and do her work. After consideration, the Admiral decided against this plan also, holding that the maneuver would cause the enemy to man all their guns and be in full preparation, and that they could divert their fire from the fleet to the Merrimack. Both he and Captain Chadwick still regarded it wisest to make the effort before daybreak. I represented again that a certain amount of light was absolutely necessary for success, that the men were under heavy tension, and that we ought not again to be recalled. It was finally decided that we should wait till the last hours of the moon, but it was agreed and understood that if I found the moonlight too dim, I should be allowed to go in after daybreak, without fear of recall. Since the last conference with the Admiral, my instinct had set more and more strongly toward the two elements of weakness, the danger of the steering gear being shot away before the time for putting the helm over, and the fragility of the electric batteries. The thought of the steering gear being shot away had been haunting me all day. Investigation showed that it was impossible to arrange for steering in any other way, 
and I called the admiral's attention to this peril as the only one that could prevent the success of the maneuver, for it was absolutely necessary that the vessel should be pointed fair so as to enter the channel without the use of helm, and for this good light was essential. The admiral said that he had already thought over the matter and fully appreciated the situation, and that the chances were against the steering gear being shot away so soon. In view of the fragility of the firing cells, the gunner was sent over with additional cells with directions to put on the four torpedoes left off the belt the night before. My conviction of the inherent weakness of this part of the plan was so strong that, as a last request, I asked the admiral a second time to allow me to take the warheads, promising that I would not use them unless the belt torpedoes proved inadequate and they were necessary to success. The admiral again refused, using the same words as before. They would blow everything to the devil. Besides the gunner and his gang, a deck force was sent over to prepare another lifeboat. This time I decided not to attempt to tow it, but to carry it slung from a cargo boom over the starboard quarter below the rail. The idea was that instead of jumping overboard, the men, after finishing their duties, would lay aft and rendezvous abreast the lifeboat, waiting until directed to get in. All being ready, the suspending line would be cut and the boat would drop adrift. The arms and equipment and the plan for handling the boat would be the same as decided on in the first instant. Attention was called to an old catamaran at hand, and it was slung over the side in a similar way near the lifeboat. As soon as it was settled that the entrance was not to be made at sunset, a relief crew was sent over, and the men from the Merrimack were sent on board the New York to get a little rest and a hearty meal. However, they were unable to sleep and cared for little refreshment except coffee. They were beyond the stage of appetite or sleep. After they arrived, Captain Chadwick called me up to say that he had seen Mullen, and there was no question about his being utterly exhausted. I had feared as much, for he had been working all night and the previous day, missing four successive meals. It is difficult for one not present to conceive the fearful condition of strain, mental and physical, that Mullen was under, when we were fighting against time in the preparations of anchors and chains. With the prolongation of anxiety and without ability to rest, he had almost passed the limit of human endurance. But he was game to the end and would not give up. It required an imperative order from Captain Chadwick to keep him back. It now became a question of selecting a man in his place. When the Iowa sent her long list of volunteers and learned that so few men were required, she selected one man from the number... Murphy, coxswain. There can be no question about a man whom a ship's company singles out to be its representative. It was decided to take Murphy, and I was to determine after seeing him whether to entrust to him Mullen's perilous duty. Signal was made to the Iowa to send him over. All remaining details were attended to. The executive officer of the New York thoughtfully directed a basket of provisions and a bucket of strong coffee to be ready, the fleet surgeon prepared two canteens of medicated water. A short while remained before the time for leaving, and I went below for a shower bath. It was deeply touching to see the kindness and thoughtfulness shown on all sides. The caterer had directed the steward's special preparation of coffee, and a cup, black and steaming, was kept ready on the table for the moment of coming below. The orderly came down to say that Captain Chadwick would be happy to have me join him in a late afternoon luncheon, most thoughtful and opportune, for I should be leaving about the dinner hour. One officer had just received some specially fine lemons and oranges. I must try them and take some along. Another had a handsome brace of pistols. Surely they would be better than the bulky service revolver. Still another had a special cordial with virtues all its own, might he not put up a bottle? Captain Miller, who had been assigned to my stateroom, was foremost in cordiality and expressions of kindness. But most touching was the solicitude of Captain Chadwick. He did not wish me to talk, for it would require exertion. I must sit down, though he and the Admiral were standing. I must lie down and sleep upon reaching the Merrimack. 
It was in vain I assured him that I was in excellent shape, with pulse normal, nerves steady, if anything a tinge phlegmatic, brain as clear as a bell. In fact, only in second wind, as it were, while the limit of endurance was not in sight. He would not be convinced, and even threatened, that if I did not take measures for resting, he should feel like advising the admiral not to let me go in next morning. In fact, before leaving, he delivered strict orders that on reaching the Merrimack I should remain below and not appear on the bridge before one o'clock. The crew of the Merrimack left the New York about six o'clock. The admiral was at the gangway, the last to say goodbye, having again a simple word of kindness, a hand pressure, a look that spoke more than a volume of words. Cadet Palmer made a last plea to be allowed to go, saying that he was assistant navigator, was in practice in taking compass bearings, and would be useful in approaching the entrance, and the admiral and chief of staff approved. Such was his elegant pleading, difficult to refuse, but the same reasons held as in the other cases. As we went over to the Merrimack, the vessels of the fleet were standing down for their night positions of blockade on the arc of a circle around the entrance, about four miles from the Moro as the center. Cadet Joseph W. Powell came to take charge with the relief crew, a pilot being with him to assist in keeping the Moro located. Upon arriving, the gunner reported that three of the torpedo connections would not respond to the test, and in consequence there were only seven for service, these being located in the position of the six of the previous night, with the addition of one aft. Moreover, he had found that the cells would act with better effect if arranged in separate groups, and had so arranged them, with ten cells to each torpedo, the cells lying on the deck abreast the torpedo, each torpedo having thus its own independent contact. In view of the additional security and not having all the cells concentrated in one spot, the arrangement was accepted, though it would require at least one additional man and would cause the firing to be less under my own control, each torpedo having thus its own independent contact. In view of the additional security and not having all the cells concentrated in one spot, the arrangement was accepted, though it would require at least one additional man and would cause the firing to be less under my own control. The boatswain's mate reported that the lifeboat and the catamaran had been arranged as directed, and his gang and the gunner's gang were sent back to the New York before we got under way, the steam launch returning to remain with the Merrimack in order to take off the relief crew when the regular crew should take charge. In the launch in which we came off, a new man was sitting in the bow. Someone said it was Murphy of the Iowa. I looked at him well and felt that there need be no hesitation about giving him Mullen's duty. Powell went on the bridge with the pilot and took charge. The Merrimack's crew were directed to lie down and try to sleep until they should be called. Powell was to have us called at one. In obedience to orders to rest, I went into the bridge house and lay down on the transom. The New York and the Merrimack stood down in company till the New York reached her blockading position. It was interesting to listen to the sounds of the engines of the vessel moving through the water and of the voices on the bridge. The two ships hailed several times and then made a farewell hail as the New York drew off to her position. The Merrimack stood on further to the southward and westward till she reached a position just outside of the blockading line with Morrow bearing about northeast. Here she lay motionless for several hours waiting for the time to start. There was a weirdness in the situation as I looked out of the airport from time to time. The moon, now nearly full, rose high and reached and passed the meridian without a cloud appearing in the sky. The Brooklyn lay off to the northwest and in the reflected light looked almost white. The Texas to the northeast, presenting her shadowy side, looked dark and menacing. The other vessels further in the distance seemed like phantoms. All lights were extinguished, and the moon was supreme in the stillness. The mountains far back beyond Santiago were scarcely visible. The peaks closer to the westward rode high with a distinct skyline. The mountains continued landward the circle of the ships. 
Sleep was out of the question. So I went over to the minutest detail, the various features of the work to be done. The torpedoes with the new arrangement were to be fired in succession, beginning forward so as to throw her down by the bow. After letting go the anchor, Murphy was to fire torpedo number one without further orders. Charette was then to fire torpedo two, then torpedo number three. Degnan, after putting the helm hard aport, was to lay down to torpedo number four and be ready to fire by the time number three went off. An additional man was to be selected from the relief crew to attend to torpedo number five. After stopping the engine, Phillips and Kelly were to open the sea connections and flood without further orders and then come on deck, and Phillips was to stand by to fire torpedo number six and Kelly torpedo number eight. Those were hours of interest and experience before the start. There was no diversion of the senses, and this fact and the feeling of loneliness seemed to deepen the impression of the closeness of God and nature. My business affairs had been disposed of at the beginning of the war, and I had no disquieting thoughts as to the past or the future. The mind and heart accepted the reality of things with deep, keen, exquisite delight. There were singular emotions as the thoroughness of preparation and the sureness of execution became clearer and clearer while the details and the processes were gone over again and again. Toward midnight, when there was no longer any chance of the moon failing, these emotions amounted to exultation, so much so that I could not help giving it expression. Charette had been sitting near at hand, in fact a little while before, when someone in the darkness had made a noise, Charette expostulated in a vehement whisper, "'Can't you keep quiet there? Don't you know Mr. Hobson is sleeping here?' I called out, "'Charette, my lad, we're going to make it tonight. There's no power under heaven can keep us out of the channel.' He seemed surprised that the outer channel was the objective, and, and said that he and all the other men thought we were going up into the harbor that the admiral, Captain Chadwick, and I had been seen consulting the chart which took in the inner harbor, and they all thought that we would go inside three miles beyond the entrance. Such was the mission for which these brave men had so ardently volunteered. At about a quarter of one, Charette was sent to call the other men and take the bucket of coffee to the fire room and bring it up steaming. About one, I went on the bridge. Powell and the pilot were walking up and down. They pointed out the Moro, just discernible with the night glasses, about five miles distant, bearing about northeast by the compass. A fine-looking seaman was at the wheel. I went close and examined him and said to myself, unless looks deceive, here is the man for the additional work with the torpedoes. Before being spoken to, he asked if he might go with us. What is your name and rate, I asked. Clausen. Coxon of the barge, sir. The rating confirmed my judgment from his looks, and I replied, Yes, you may go. When relieved at the wheel, you will be given your station and duties. The delight in the man's face could be seen in the moonlight. Clausen's inclusion in the crew was thus entirely regular. The report that he was a stowaway was doubtless due to the fact that he was not in the original crew of six determined upon before the rearrangement of the torpedo connections. Powell reported that the Admiral had directed the steam launch, after putting off the New York's men on the nearest blockading vessel, to stand in toward the entrance and stand by to lend assistance to the Merrimack's crew in escaping. This measure had been suggested by me, because the admiral seemed so solicitous about our escape when considering the question of going in at sunset. I had suggested the measure only in connection with the sunset plan, and made no further reference to it when decision was made against that hour, since it was questionable whether the chances of escape were sufficient to justify the exposure of the launch's crew. Powell's report was, therefore, a surprise. It was too late to consult the admiral again, his decision in the matter must be accepted. I asked Powell if his engines and fires were muffled. He answered yes, that he had put over canvas covers, that the launch's regular crew had all volunteered, and that all preparations had been made. It was interesting to see his own delight at the prospect of the work. 
we arranged the rendezvous. The launch would creep up from the westward and watch for the appearance of boat or men. If the boat were destroyed and the men could not stand out against the tide running flood, he would endeavor to dash across the entrance for the rendezvous under the seaward side of the Moro, near the mouth of the caverns. Charette now brought the coffee on the bridge. Some sandwiches were at hand. All the crew came up, and Mr. Crank from the engine room, and we had a cheerful breakfast. Even the pipe came out as usual. About half-past one we turned to, and the men went to their stations. I went the round, fore and aft, to go over the duties with each man. Murphy, on the forecastle, was given the same instructions that Mullen had had. In addition, after receiving the cord signal to cut the anchor lashing, and after the lashing had been cut on the starboard side, he was to pass over to the port side and make contact to fire torpedo number one, without further orders. Murphy listened without a word to all the instructions concerning the precautions to be taken in view of the exposure in firing the torpedo, for the forecastle was narrow and while making contact he would still be in danger from the Russian chain and the breaking stops and hawsers. Moreover, the forecastle had no bulwark or rail, and though high above it he would be exposed to a heavy blast from the torpedo explosion, the collision bulkhead being directly beneath. Indeed, it was intimated that he might be wounded by the explosion even under the best conditions of precaution. He examined the lashing and block under it, saw the new axe at hand, found the end of the signal cord, examined the wire ends for making contact, and replied simply, "'It shall be done, sir.'" Charette was already familiar with torpedoes number two and number three. Degnan was taken to torpedo number four, Phillips to torpedo number six, and Kelly to torpedo number eight, and each was instructed as to the firing. Montague's duties were the same as for the first run. Degnan relieved Clausen at the wheel, and Clausen was taken to torpedo number five. Phillips and Kelly would have the same duties below as previously arranged. All were instructed about the rendezvous and directed afresh to lie on their faces, except while executing work, and to pay no attention to the enemy's fire, no matter what it might be. Goodbyes were now exchanged. The New York's men, Powell and the pilot, disembarked, just then Mr. Crank came up and reported engines and boilers ready for the run, the boilers requiring no further firing. The launch had shoved off and was some distance away, and Mr. Crank repeated the tender of his services to go in. It would have been wrong to accept them. I hailed the launch. There was no reply. Then I hailed again, louder. Still there was no reply. On a still louder hail, it stopped, came back, and took Mr. Crank. Then it was that this gallant engineer left the Merrimack. He had not gone from her for a moment during the whole course of preparations, had not had a moment's rest in two days and two nights, and had been repairing the boilers and putting them in shape while the others were unengaged. He had expected to go in the first day and had passed through all the experience of suspense preceding action. The launch headed for the Texas and was soon lost sight of. Preparation was ended. The road was clear. The hour for execution had come. End of Part 2 Section 1